Approximately during 4000 BC, early Bronze Age humanity spread from Africa and the Middle East into southeastern Europe and Russia. These people are categorised by scholars as the Proto-Indo-Europeans due to their shared language and roots. From archaeological evidence, we can be certain that they were Bronze Age, because of a lack of physical evidence such as tools and more tellingly, their language seemingly having no word for iron, implying they had not discovered it at the time. However, they did have words for silver and gold, giving us the impression that they did have access to these materials. These materials would have been gathered from quarrying, and in the case of gold, found in the form of gold-bearing sediments embedded within riverbeds. Now back to migration, we can see through this map the settlement of land by these people, with the inner magenta representing the predating culture. The red approximately represents the area settled by 2500 BC, and the orange represents what is believed to have been settled by 1000 BC. During the next 3000 years, the Proto-Indo-Europeans would exponentially grow and eventually come to inhabit most of Europe. This includes places such as Denmark, Germany and the Netherlands, which is where the Angles, Saxons and Jutes would originate from. Fast forward to the early to mid 5th century, the descendants of the Proto-Indo-Europeans that inhabited the places, colloquially known as Jutes, Angles and Saxons, began to migrate to the southern and southeastern parts of Britain by the means of longboats across the British Channel. An example of one of these ships, seen now, shows that these vessels had no sails and were entirely driven by oars along the port and starboard. They have a heavy similarity to the Viking longboats that would eventually raid the coasts of the country. At this point, Britain was known as being in a state known as Sub-Roman, meaning that the Roman Empire had largely lost direct control of southern Britain, these being the parts below Hadrian's Wall. This gave the Anglo-Saxons a perfect opportunity to take advantage of the situation and settle the lands. The settlement of Britain was easier than most would expect, with the indigenous population paying tithes of food to the Anglo-Saxons in exchange for protection from raiders that could come from distant lands across the sea. Furthermore, their integration was aided by their cultural and religious similarities, being derived from the Proto-Indo-Europeans. This would lead to a large quantity of Germanic words being introduced into the native language. One important part of the integration was religion, which to this day still plays a part in world politics. The key factor, however, was the religious similarities that the people of Europe held, which were all derived from the proto indo european peoples. This belief is a predecessor of Norse mythology, with various analogous examples including a god who is referred to as being the Sky Father. Most people within Europe had roughly the same religious beliefs with cultural variations, language deviations and corruption slowly deviating the names and connotations of the gods, making them more distinct over time. But however, when Christianity arrived from the East, it slowly but surely integrated with the beliefs of the people. This is seen in the reactionary Celtic monasticism, a native Celtic response to Roman Christianity brought to Britain by Augustine of Canterbury. Celtic Christianity was an Irish and Scottish equivalent of what was seen in Rome, with its own unique systems which include their own style of monastic tonsure. The biggest advantage monasticism brought was a widespread learning of classical knowledge, which today we would attribute to literacy and history. This encouragement would eventually lead to the unification of the country with the first Christian king, Ethelbert of Kent. This caused paganism to fall into obscurity over the next few hundred years with it turning into folklore with the peasantry as a result of suppression from the church. After the introduction of the church into society, it became prevalent that there were three groups or classes in their society. A king by the name of King Alfred observed that there were three pillars within society at the time. These were the praying men, fighting men and working men. Praying men will be those who lived a monastic life or who are within some service to the church. Furthermore, they will be mostly of the Benedictine order which spread scholarly pursuits and led a largely ascetic lifestyle. This is where they will give up most material things within their lives and live very minimalistically. The working men will be the average peasant known then as a curl, who would likely have been working in a village doing whatever they were best suited at for the time. These people would have a low man price, which will be the value of that individual in a literal and societal sense. 
This value would come into effect if someone was murdered, for example. The murderer would have to pay the man price. However, with the introduction of Christianity, capital punishment took the place of this. And lastly, there are the fighting men. These individuals are from different villages who would have been formed as a part of an agreement to a local lord or king. These people would have a mix of professional and semi-professional skills and would have been formed when a situation arose. An example of this would be when the Vikings raided the coasts of Britain. Uh, well, his main uh, weapon would be his shield because uh, that stops him being killed. But uh, apart from the shield, he would have either a sword, a langsax, which is a, a short, well, a fairly long bladed knife, about 12 inches long, and a spear. The standard weapon of a freeman would have been a spear. Depending on which period you're looking at, there's the early Anglo-Saxon period, which was the most violent. That's from about 450 AD up to about 850. Uh, and in that time, generally everybody would be have some warrior training, but you wouldn't have a specific warrior class. Uh, the head man of the village would require to have some martial skill, but generally uh, there wouldn't be that much fighting. The idea is to avoid having a fight. However, one group or class King Alfred missed was the slaves. Slaves were people who were owned by another. The work they did varied from owner to owner and although they had no man price, killing one would still be a crime and the recompense would be in the form of payment to the owner. They could still be freed or released however, but that would make them freed men, an underclass of people who had less man price than the average curl. An interesting part of Anglo-Saxon culture is the language itself. Although completely unfamiliar to modern English, Old English functions largely the same, with common connotations and associations with dialectic words emerging over time. A good example is that of the word Grima. A Grima is a face mask that is a part of a helmet to protect the wearer's face. However, it could be used to give the connotation that someone is not trustworthy or is a liar because a Grima conceals your face, or acts as a false face meaning that they are purposefully changing or concealing the truth. Another common element in the language is the word eilf, meaning fair or light coloured. It is the Old English equivalent for the modern English word elf, but holds further connotations. For example, the word for swan is eelfetu. The elf part refers to the white coloration of the swan. But the meaning extends to names as well, with the previously mentioned King Aethelbert meaning bright noble, bright being a connotation of elf. In this segment, I will be looking at technology, and in particular, the production of tools and clothing. Tools at this time were an incredibly important commodity. It is said that having a local town blacksmith was highly desirable, since having the ability to repair existing implements and create more is important for sustaining efficiency in any given environment. Basically all uh, weapons are made from either iron or steel, and they'd be forged by the local blacksmith. Although uh, that is a more complicated view, uh, the blacksmith generally uh, would have been peripatetic, which means he moved from one village to another. And he would go around the villages every couple of months and manufacture any items they wanted. However, having the resources is just as important as the technical knowledge. To get the materials needed, they would have to quarry any available sources, being either surface deposits on cliffs to deep vertical pits, at the time, the Anglo-Saxons had access to iron, silver, gold, lead, bronze and steel. Although the steel was found in minor concentrations at varying qualities, these being low to high carbon steel. The reason for this was mostly because they didn't have refined techniques for effectively creating steel in large quantities reliably. Iron was the most commonly used as it was reasonably durable and could be taken from multiple sources. These sources include ciderite, which would require preliminary roasting, and limonite, which is known as bog ore, as it is found within meadows and marshes. Uh, in this country, the, uh, there's three main ores, uh, and depending on which part of the country you're in, the access to them varies. Uh, probably the most easiest one to get hold of is bog ore, but that has a very high phosphorus content, which makes the steel quite, or rather the iron, brittle. 
Processing of iron ore is as follows. First that you place the iron ore within the furnace. Then you layer wood over the iron. The wood is then set on fire which with additional fuel allows the iron to melt over time. The iron is retrieved from what is left at the bottom of the slag pit. The iron has a large amount of impurities, so re-smelting is required to make it practically usable in tools. This can be seen in this diagram of the furnace. Uh, smelting was very successful. Uh, it is a long and complicated process uh, producing the actual iron, uh, but the smelting process would produce a lump of iron about probably about the size of your fist, uh, and also you could get fragments of high carbon steel, and if you're very, very lucky on the odd smell, you'd have an entire fistful of, of uh, carbon steel. Another important part of production was the creation of cloth. Cloths at the time were mostly made up of wool, with some linens and rarely silk, which would be spun into strands, which were then twisted together into a yarn through the use of drop spindle, as seen here. In conclusion, the Anglo-Saxon people were one of the most influential cultures to step onto Britain. Their reign ended with the Norman invasion of 1066, with the introduction of a new monarchy, a culture still continued with the peasant folk who continued their traditions. Music